The following program is made possible in part by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. For so much of my life, I always thought Elijah went up into heaven in a chariot of fire. You'll hear, hear people say that. The song gets in your head. Nobody? No, still nothing. The day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, guests. Welcome, church family. We're so happy you're here. You know, this morning, let's remind ourselves of all God has done for us and all He's provided for us, and let's worship Him today in spirit and in truth. Amen. Amen. Thank let's you for being here. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us and all that you're doing. We love you, God. And we pray that your spirit would be poured out on us today as we seek your face. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All people said, amen. amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you, and so do I. I was singing with my sisters. I was singing. My friends, and we all can sing together, cause the circle never ends. Will the circle be unbroken? But Open your Bibles with me to 2 Kings 2.9. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? 
Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, Suddenly, a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment, oh, his garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi, friends. We're so happy you joined us in worship today. You are the beloved of God, and we are truly thankful that you've chosen to be a part of this church family. Jesus is the keeper of the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and he gives them to us when we exercise our faith. By leaning into our faith, we lean into big dreams and bold possibilities. Matthew 16, 19 says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Faith unlocks doors for us and is the essential component of a productive, abundant, and fruitful life, which is why living in the kingdom of God is absolutely the best way. Your faithfulness to our power unlocks many blessings to viewers in your city and around the world. Because we are thankful for your ongoing support, our team has a very special offer for you today. Call, write, or go online today and request the two-in-one Faith Key Necklace. This fashionable gold necklace with a heart-shaped key design is etched with the word faith in cursive, and the unique magnetic lobster clasp allows you to layer your necklaces while keeping them tangle-free. Give this beautiful necklace to your friend, daughter, or granddaughter, or wear it yourself as a reminder of the people you have shared God's love with through Hour of Power. We're asking for your gift of $30 or more. As you embrace the coming year, remember that being connected to God empowers you to be more and do more than you ever imagined possible. You can do greater things when your faith is ignited and the presence and power of the kingdom of heaven opens up within and around you. This is the key to everything in our prayer for you and your loved ones today. Thank you for being a part of our Hour of Power family. Havila Cunnington is an author, podcast host, and pastor who has served in ministry for over 20 years. She currently serves at Bethel Church in Redding, California as the women's pastor. Her new book, Created to Hear God, Four Unique and Proven Ways to Confidently Discern His Voice, provides readers with a guide on how to recognize God's voice and how it isn't as complicated as we think. Please welcome Havila Cunnington. Havila, hi, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Thank you for having me. You guys are up north in Redding, California, so we're your Southern California brothers and sisters down here. But you're up at yes. Bethel Church. What an awesome place to do ministry, le uh, leading women there, listening to the Spirit. And I'm super excited about your book, Created to Hear God. But before we uh, jump into that, tell us a little bit about your faith journey. Yeah, so I was a pastor's kid who um, was really kind of trying to stay under the radar. It really happened in third grade when I was diagnosed with dyslexia and reading comprehension issues and some ADHD. And so I just felt like I was kind of broken. And then when I got into my faith, I felt also like I had nothing to really offer. I wasn't really amazing at anything. I wasn't a singer. I wasn't, you know, all the things. And so when I was a teenager, I was really motivated to stay under the radar in both academics and at church. And one night some guys picked my twin sister, I have an identical twin sister up to go to a party. And in the backseat of this car, we're just going to a party we would normally go to. 
the Holy Spirit speaks to me. And it's not audible, but it's that clear, still voice. That's just something you weren't even thinking about. And he says to me, Havala, what are you doing? And it got my attention. And I, I knew he was saying something. And he said, you've got to get out of here. You have a call on your life. You've got to get out of this car. Yeah. So I didn't know what to do. But at 17, I asked the guys in the front to turn the music down. And I awkwardly blurred out, I have a call of God on my life, which <laughs> nobody responds. It's very, very awkward. Yeah. And then through tears, I say, I'm going to serve God. This is what I'm going to do. And they ended up taking us home without us even asking to go home. We never made it to the party. Uh, but I went into my bedroom that night and I, through tears, knelt by my bed and said, God, I'm not much. I'm young. I'm 17. I'm a girl. I have obviously other challenges. I don't really think I could do anything significant for you. And yet, if you can use me, I'm available. And that was really a, I, I, I call it my going public night, yeah. where I think all of us have to go public in our faith, because once we go public, grace happens, Amen. and we begin to live in, in one world. So yeah. There is something really important about that public declara declaration, isn't there? I mean, I, I, I think often about the Bible verse where Jesus says something like, if you deny me before others, I'll deny you. If you acknowledge me before others, I'll acknowledge you before my father. And I, I think often about how, even sometimes as a pastor, I kind of like try not to let people know I'm a pastor if it's my day off. I kind of just want to have my <laughs> coffee, you know? And I think that's not it, you know? That's not it, brother. I gotta be, you know, I don't get to choose a day off for the Lord, you know? And um, for as a women's <laughs> pastor, I think, Man, it's, it's probably interesting. You probably have a lot of women actually uh, at Bethel asking you, I mean, it's a church that encourages hearing God's voice, receiving revelation from the Holy Spirit. I'm sure you've had a lot of coaching one-on-one, -on -one, talking with women about you know, how to hear God's voice. One of my big questions would be, and there's also probably people like in the secular world that watch the show that are thinking like, are these people crazy? Are they here? So like, you know, are they hearing like audible, like, you know, Monty right. Python voices coming out of the sky or something? <laughs> if you were going to tell someone who's either a new Christian or someone that is not familiar with the faith, what we mean when we talk about hearing God's voice, I think there were like four or five things you mentioned in, in your book that I thought were super yeah. good. Can we talk about yeah. those and sort of like what, it, what we're talking about when we mean hearing God's voice? Yeah, so you and I both know we're not looking for audible voices. If you are hearing consistent audible voices, then we we would say, okay, you know, the, obviously there might be another challenge, but we're talking about an inner knowing, a voice of the Holy Spirit that resonates within us. And I often was, as a young woman and in ministry, almost 30 years now, I find that my battle that I thought was my own, which is, I don't know how to hear God's voice. I'm not sure. And the person across the way really knows. I found that I wasn't alone and that I thought everyone heard God the same way. And the way that I was taught how to hear was a specific you know, method. And when I began to learn how to hear God's voice and teach thousands of people on how to hear God's voice, I found that we were not all hearing the same thing. Yeah. And what I found was that it wasn't just my battle, it was a collective battle of people in the faith that say, when you say God speaks, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> or I can only think of this hero that knows what God is saying and I don't, and I don't know what to do about it. So I kind of really went on this journey to figure out how do we actually engage in hearing God's voice? And I call it prophetic personalities, like the five love languages. Yeah. I find that God has given us this, this ability to connect with him uniquely. I think one of the problems we've done is we have put everybody in the same box at, at our faith environments. Everyone yeah. hears God this way. And so what I found were there are four methods. So again, these are just ways that, uh, again, God doesn't need a strategy. We have the Bible. He is can speak to us in any way he wants to. So we are not boxing God in to be sovereign and supernatural. Sure. But I do want to start to unpack what are ways we can clearly identify. So I call it the knower feeler, seer, and hear. So just simply it's this, the knower is the light bulb. They're the one that knows something. It's like they walk in a room and they know. It's like when I was in the backseat of the car and I knew I had to get out of there, there was a supernatural knowing. Did like I a hear gut thing, voice? right? A gut, it's like a, mm -hmm. and it's rises to the surface. It's like they say, you know it in your knower. It's rise to the surface. There's no visuals or audible or, you know, there's no angel. It's just, I know. Yeah. And a lot of people, honestly, a lot of my knowers feel like heathens in church because they don't have a seeing and a, know, a hearing and all the, the, the 
you know, fireworks. Yeah. They simply just know. It's like they know the truth and they have this in intuition and it's supernatural. So God speaks to a knower through uh, an intuition, a wisdom, clarity, a prompting. Paul took Timothy instinctively. There are those of you that think you can't hear God and yet you have intuitively and supernaturally made decisions and life choices that have aligned with the will of God for your life. Then you have your seer. Your seer are those that God speaks to through pictures, imagery, imagery, um, dreams, visions. They're the ones that they see the orphanage being built and they're instantly filled with faith for it. Yeah. Or God speaks to them in a kind of a picture in their mind where they see it playing out. I feel and like uh, Sean, you know Sean Bowles? I feel like he's kind of that yes. way. Exactly. Sean is very much, he's a friend of mine and he's very much like that. Yeah. And seers are actually very unique. In fact, we gave 155,000 people the prophetic personality test and we found that the least amount were seers. So if you're a seer, you're on a unique level of hearing God through imagery, dreams, and visions. Then you have your hearers and your hearers are those classic, like you and I were taught that hearing God we used, I mean, most of us were brought to the story with Samuel, which is, you know, Eli says to him, go lay down, ask God, you know, speak for your servant is listening. That's how we were taught was that yeah. we would hear words, phrases, conversations, narrations. And so your hearers are their classic. They're the kind of the traditional and they really have a conversational relationship with God. They have a play by play. They hear something, they go a little bit longer. They hear something else. They're kind of classic journalers. They're really good at kind of documenting what God is saying. Yeah. Um, and they have a lot of words. And then lastly, you have our feelers. And our feelers are those that God interacts with in, in a very uh, emotional, physical way. It can be a burden. It can be an emotion of feeling his heart for somebody or knowing what you're supposed to do or how to actually pray about something. Feelers are those that when they go into an environment, they, they actually experience something physically. And so many times we go, well, is, does everyone experience that? No. Does that make them wrong? No, it makes them different. And what I found is that all of us experience love uniquely and all of us are created to hear God differently. And so the goal is not to compare. The goal is to figure out your primary way in which God interacts with you and then grow in the other areas that are available to us. Awesome. I want to encourage you if you're watching now and you want to know like which of those five ways you feel like you hear from God to get a copy of Havala Kennington's book uh, created to hear God. Thank you, Havala, for joining us. We appreciate you so much. And uh, we're looking for forward to reading your book. Me. God bless you. Thanks. Thank you. Hi friends, we're so happy you joined us in worship today. You are the beloved of God and we are truly thankful that you've chosen to be a part of this church family. Jesus is the keeper of the keys to the kingdom of heaven and he gives them to us when we exercise our faith. By leaning into our faith, we lean into big dreams and bold possibilities. Matthew 16, 19 says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Faith unlocks doors for us and is the essential component of a productive, abundant and fruitful life, which is why living in the kingdom of God is absolutely the best way. Your faithfulness to our power unlocks many blessings to viewers in your city and around the world. Because we are thankful for your ongoing support, our team has a very special offer for you today. Call, write, or go online today and request the two-in-one Faith Key Necklace. This fashionable gold necklace with a heart-shaped key design is etched with the word faith in cursive and the unique magnetic lobster clasp allows you to layer your necklaces while keeping them tangle-free. Give this beautiful necklace to your friend, daughter, or granddaughter, or wear it yourself as a reminder of the people you have shared God's love with through Hour of Power. We're asking for your gift of $30 or more. As you embrace the coming year, remember that being connected to God empowers you to be more and do more than you ever imagined possible. You can do greater things when your faith is ignited and the presence and power of the kingdom of heaven opens up within and around you. This is the key to everything in our prayer for you and your loved ones today. Thank you for being a part of our Hour of Power family. Sixty, so 
something changing me Red letters coming off the page Filling my heart with amazing grace I knew then that I believed And those roots run deep Oh, I've been through some face-shaking hard times, yeah But nothing's gonna make me Today we're going to talk about this uh, important human principle that I believe in the core of my being is, is key to every human life feeling alive. To every single person, every person here wants to make an impact with their life. I don't think every person here wants to be famous. I don't think every person here wants to be rich. I don't even think everyone here wants to be popular. But I believe everyone here wants to have a purpose wants to feel like their life made an impact, wants to feel like they left it a little better than when they came here. You're at church after all, right? We come to church to, to do better, to be better. And I just believe that every single person here not only needs that, but is called to a great purpose from God. And this whole idea of what's my purpose, what's my calling, very confusing, gets a lot of people down. And so today we're going to crack the purpose code. I'm calling that the purpose code today. How do we crack life's mission and blueprint? And I hope to, you leave here with a clear idea of some simple steps you can take to build the thing that will build you up, to build the dream that will build you up, to build the goal that will strengthen you. And we'll begin with a really interesting old story from the Bronze Age about Elijah and Elisha. It's going to get confusing because their names are so similar. I'll do my best to differentiate. The rabbis in Jesus' day saw Elijah, the elder, and Elisha, the younger, as the first rabbi-disciple relationship that ever exists in the Bible. And they tried to use it as a model for the ideal rabbi-disciple relationship, and we'll see why. First of all, Elijah, the elder, in his day was an absolute legend. The amazing things that God did through his life. 
Uh, and not all of them were, you know, you know, healing people. There was a lot of like scary things he did, the Old Testament things he did that made him utterly famous everywhere and a, actually a terrifying person and a very popular and interesting person. Most of what he was doing was against the wicked king. And, uh, and Elijah just very popular. Everybody knows who he is. And I like to think in my mind that Elisha, the younger, his future disciple, when he's a young man, perhaps thinks to himself, man, I want to be like that someday. I want to be used by God someday. I want to see fire come down from heaven like that. I want to speak to power the way he does. I want to heal the sick the way he does. I want to hear the oracles of God the way he does. And maybe even one time made the mistake of saying that aloud. And maybe when he said it aloud, somebody said, young man, you are a farmer, young man. You are not a prophet. You don't hear from God. Young man. Uh, perhaps people would say about Elijah the Younger, what a dreamer. What a fool. What a dummy. I suppose you want to starve. And it's hard for me not to imagine because the Bible is so full of, of dreamers and doers and miracle workers that maybe that same Elijah still... Like, they, uh, like uh, Joseph held a dream in his heart all those years. And one day, wouldn't you know it, he was out there, the younger Elisha, out there plowing the field, getting ready to sow some seed, doing his thing. And one day, this famous prophet, out of nowhere, terrifying figure, remember? Terrifying. Shows up, and Elisha sees him and instantly knows in his spirit who this man is. And Elijah the elder says, Elisha, to, to Elisha the younger, follow me. And what does Elisha the younger do? Just like the disciples, doesn't really ask any questions, doesn't really fill out an application, doesn't get his credit checked. No, sir. Right there on the spot, he takes his plow, which is made of lumber, and he chops it up into firewood. It's probably his most valuable tool. This is the Bronze Age, by the way. People are, live to the average age of 33. So it's not a safe place to live. So he chops up his thing into bits of wood, slaughters all of his oxen, and right there on the spot calls the town together and throws a huge party. He basically th th calls what we would think of as a te big Texas barbecue. <laughs> right there on the spot. In the Bronze Age, to eat meat was a huge deal. You know, you know it's just only very special occasions on holidays. And these big, delicious slabs of Texas brisket, you know, are just given to everybody. And right there, on, it's interesting, because Elisha begins his ministry with a tremendous act of both sacrifice and generosity. But we also remember that he's kind of burning the ships, as we say. He's abandoning everything. He's getting rid of his exit. He has nothing to go back to anymore, nothing to save him, no ox to plow the field. It's over. Wow. And uh, I, when I think of this story, I often, I often think of that old hymn, remember? I have, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back, no turning back. I'm not going back. And that brings us to the Bible verse we have today, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. There's this uh, unsettling thing between the two of them. You know, they've become now, you know, like Obi-Wan and Luke, you know, forgive me. They've become like Jesus and one of his disciples, so deeply connected to each other, so ingrained with one another, so into this ministry together, like a father and a son. And now there's this rumbling that Elijah's going to go soon, and we don't know where. And it says this, if you have your Bible, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. When they crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, so the elder says to the younger, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? I like to think he searched his heart a little bit, maybe blurted it out. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked for a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Now, we know in the Bible, Elisha is actually the only character that never dies and goes to heaven. Uh, a lot of people say Enoch, but that's just tradition. Eli really, Elijah is the only one. 
And it's funny because for so much of my life, I always thought Elijah went up into heaven in a chariot of fire. You'll hear, hear people say that. The song gets in your head. Nobody? Dun, dun, nah, nah, nah. No, still nothing? All right, thank you, Brittany. You think a chariot of fire picks him up and takes him into heaven, and it's really not that. What is the point of the chariot of fire? We just read it. It's to separate them. Think about that for a minute. It's a whirlwind that takes Elijah into heaven. Elijah and Elisha are so connected to each other as disciple rabbi, so ingrained as teacher-student, so father-son, so family. I picture that Elisha, as this whirlwind's trying to take Elijah into heaven, Elisha's like almost holding him by the ankles, saying, no, no, no. Right? And when he actually goes into heaven, he tears his cloak and he cries out, my father, my father. So what is it the chariot of fire does? Chariot of fire parts them. It takes God himself to part the two. Isn't that amazing? You know, we, can, we could be, we could hold on to God this tight. Did you know that? We could be this into our faith. We could be so committed to Christ that it would take heaven and earth to part us. It's possible. It's possible to hang on to the Lord that tight. Many of us say we would, say we do. Many of us are like the young guy, like a young man who's in love with a gal, and he sings a song to her. I love you so much. I'd climb the highest mountain. I love you so much. I'd swim the deepest ocean. I'd wade the widest river. And if it's not raining on Friday, I'll pick you up at 7. <laughs> right? And we do this. I mean, we do this with the Lord. You know, we sing these songs. Oh, Lord, I lay my life down for you. I do anything for you. I give it all for you. But I can't really tithe or go to church. Right? I do anything for you. I lay down my life for you. But I'm kind of busy. You know, I'm not saying that as judgment, by the way. Look at me more as like a personal trainer. That annoying guy who reminds you, not to make you feel guilty, but reminds you of the reward that's available if you're willing. If you're willing to pay the price, if you're willing to do the thing, if you're willing to be different than your neighbor, if you're willing to commit your life to God, all the double portion stuff that's available for you. A lot of people in here think, it's not available to me. It is available to you. It's available to you. And that's the first thing I want you to get in your heart today is to not miss out on the spirit, not miss out on the power, not miss out on the purpose. Elijah receives that double portion, by the way. Did you know that? The actual mantle of Elijah falls from the sky and walks down. He takes it, puts it on his back, slaps the Jordan with it, parts the river, starts performing miracles. And in fact, we know that the double portion of his spirit that he's talking about is actually talking about his power, miracle-working power. And we know that because Elijah the elder has seven miracles in his ministry. Elisha the younger has 14. And I still believe that two times seven is 14. Is that still true in Southern California? I believe it is. All right. So here's the first thing I want you to get from this text, from the story, is that God's heart is for, is for his people to ask for a double portion. God wants you to ask for a double portion. He wants you to ask for more. He wants you to grab more from life. More from the scripture, more from the spirit, more from the day. To get from the week, to get from the day, to get from the experience, to get even from the loss, to get from the moment. He wants you to get double. That's what God wants for us. Scripture says in John 14, very truly. Now what's the difference between truly and very truly? Any takers? Look, if something is very truly... And the Son of God is saying it. It means, listen up. This is about as true as it gets. I guarantee 100% this is real. You need to hear what I'm going to say. So what does he say? Very truly, I tell you what. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do what? Even greater things than these. Why? Because he's going to the Father. He's trained us to do what he does and to do a double portion a double portion. Here's something that if you saw it without context, you'd think was a heresy. But it's a faithful saying. Here's a worthy saying that you can say with faith that is orthodox and good. 
I want to do greater things than Jesus because he's gone to the Father. Now, if you saw something like that, like red flags up everywhere, right? No, I can't do greater things than Jesus, but he said it. Not only did he say it, he said very truly before he said it. He really wants it. He wants us to get a double portion of his spirit. He wants us to make an impact. He wants us to have a purpose. He wants us to do the miracles. He wants us to live the life. He wants us to take and do all that we can for the kingdom of God. He wants us to be all that we can be. Amen. We need a great purpose in our lives. We need it. We need it to wake up in the morning and be excited about life. So much better to have a great future, a great purpose. So there's a lot of confusion. So let's, let's drill down on this purpose thing. Number one, we need to get a purpose big enough to stretch us. I don't know if you've ever stretched before, but if it doesn't hurt, you're not stretching. Right? If it's not a little tight, if it's not a little uncomfortable, you're not really stretching. Now, some of you are flexible enough, it's very hard to get a good stretch. I'm not one of them. I cannot do the splits. I tried. But we need to get a purpose big enough to stretch us. We need to get a purpose big enough to strengthen us. We need to get a purpose big enough to build us, to, re to, to grab a reason to become better, to read the books, to do the thing. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. Boy, is that true. A team without a vision perishes. A business without a vision perishes. A church without a vision perishes. A nation without a vision perishes. And so a person without a vision for their life begins to wither and spiritually die. As it was said by Henry David Thoreau, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation and go to the grave with the song still in their hearts. Why? Why? Because they do what's safe, you see? They don't go for the purpose, the vision, the big goal, the dream of their life. Many of us in this building have been doing something like that, working on something like that, experiencing something like that. And it doesn't matter how bad it gets or how hard it gets, we feel alive. And when we, li we live a life without a vision, without a purpose, and everything's going perfectly, we feel kind of dead. So what does that tell us? Get a vision. Get a dream. It's important to take some time for you and to go somewhere where you can think. If you got kids, get a, get a babysitter or call your parents or someone and go to the cafe or go on a hike or go to a sacred special place just for you, just alone. Bring something to write on and write down your double mantle, double portion dream. Write it down. Where would you go if you could go anywhere? What would you do? Who would you experience it with? What would you feel? What would you look at? What would you look like? How many hearts would you touch? What kind of an impact would you make? Write it down. Forget about the rules. Forget about even reality. Just write it down in your imagination. What would it look like? It's possible for you. It's possible for you. You write it down, and then here's the real key. Keep writing it down every day. This is where I lose everybody. <laughs> You know, it's not that hard to write down three sentences every day. It's just not. But it's also, it's easy to write three sentences, right? It's also easy not to. And I can tell you that when I started writing down my goals every day, and I do, and I know it's aggravating everybody that I keep saying that, I learned that from some older men who were very, very successful in what they did. And they told me to do it, and I did it, and it's worked. Let me tell you, write down the goal. Write down the goal. And your whole life will begin to move in that direction. As was said, where your focus goes, your energy flows. You begin to work in the direction of a greater purpose than wherever it is you are now. And this is the key. Purpose pulls us through. It pulls us through the setback. It pulls us through the bankruptcy. It pulls us through the lawsuit. It pulls us through the death of a friend. It pulls us through the economic hard times. Be pulled by the future. Be pulled by the future. I read that Lao Tzu said, if you're focusing on the past, you're depressed. If you're focusing on the future, you're anxious. If you're focusing on the present, you're at peace. Everybody say, hogwash. <laughs> hogwash is hogwash. The future. If the future makes you anxious, good. That means you got a big enough dream. 
See, when we're afraid of something, that means it's where we're supposed to go. Fear's a good thing. Fear's a good thing. Why? Because it calls you to be bigger. It calls you to be more. It calls you to stick your chin up. It calls you to pull your shoulders back. It calls you to fight. It calls you to be all that you can be. Yes, we all need a big goal, a big future, a big vision that gets us excited out of bed. Amen? Being present doesn't get you out of bed in the morning. It, it helps you hit the snooze button. I'm just going to be present. No, no sir. <laughs> Amen. Okay. I lost my train of thought. This lazo made me angry. Uh, what was I going to talk about? Oh, yeah. Be pulled by the future. It needs to excite you. A future full of wonder, full of possibility. Big goals. Here, and this is the other thing that has driven me crazy, and it took me a long time to figure this out. Guess what? Big goals take as much effort as small goals. Big churches take as much effort as small churches. Big businesses take as much effort as small businesses. Big works of art, big projects, big shows, big books, big audiences. It takes as much work as a small. And it just requires a different set of skills, like delegating. And when I say delegating, I don't have time for this. This will be another sermon almost for sure. There's a big difference between delegating and abdicating. You don't give it to someone and put your fingers in your ears and go, la, 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 la. Delegating, training, casting a vision, recruiting, building a great team uh, can make a difference. I digress. So build a purpose big enough to build you up. If you build your dream, your dream will build you. Now, here's the other thing I like to believe. We talk about big, big dreams, but we also got to talk about the tiny dreams. See, the only bad dream is the middle dream. We want huge dreams and then tiny little milestones along the way. Tiny little milestones. This is so important. It's important because you need to get your first little win under your belt. As they all uh, say, a thousand mile journey begins with what? A single step. You got to have a thousand mile journey, but you also got to take a little step. And you can look and say, whoa, I just took a step. Oh, there's another one. I'm making progress. John Wimber, when he was coming out of the Jesus movement, they wanted to see a move of God like they saw in the Bible. They wanted to believe that that could happen. But I met a friend of John Wimber's, now an old man, and he had told me some of the stories of what it was like being in that world. And though we know of the many, many miracles that were performed for the vin through the vineyard, they started with just believing God to heal elbow pain. Isn't that funny? They were like, we're just going to believe for elbow pain. We're going to believe for elbow pain. And they started getting, the only miracle that they would get is people's elbows would get healed. But see, I think they needed that. They needed the little elbow before they had the huge miracles. And when they saw the little elbow pain getting healed, that gave them bigger faith to believe for bigger miracles. And it snowballed into this, you know, great move of God. It's important in general in life. People ask things like, I'm going to go to the gym and work out for two hours and all this stuff. It's like, just go faithfully to the gym three or four days a week and just do a little something and then get it bigger. Just get in the habit of going. People say, I want to write a big book. I want to write this huge book. I just got to get started. But, I, you know, it's such, so daunting to write a book. Don't think about writing. Write the book. That's the big dream. But just write a single page. If you write one page every day, after a year, how many pages are you going to have? I'm hearing a lot of different numbers. There's one answer to this. 365 pages. It's okay. Some of you are trying to figure out if there was a leap year. <laughs> 360. Last time I, I heard a 365-page document was called a, a book. That's right. Maybe you say, I can't write a page. Then write a paragraph. You say, I can't write a paragraph. Write a sentence. Say, I can't write a sentence and write a word. And then guess what? You just write that first word and you write two words and you say, whoa, I doubled my goal for today. <laughs> and as crazy as this hack sounds, can I tell you, it works, brother. It works. Making tiny goals and achieving them and then over becoming an overachiever. Whoa, I didn't walk 10 feet today. I walked a whole block. I'm getting fit. Don't try to have an hour quiet time every day. Try and have a five-minute quiet time every day. Don't try and read a whole chapter of the Bible. Just read a verse. Start there, and you'll get the momentum going. The tiny goals get us there. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. I even made a slide. 
I once saw uh, recently on YouTube a sort of TikTok short from a, this young woman, probably in her early 20s, and she told how she had this crippling fear of rejection. And she tried therapy and she tried all these things and nothing was working. And so she just decided that the only way she was going to get over her fear of rejection was just to get rejected over and over. So she started doing all these things to get rejected. The first thing she did was apply to Harvard. And guess what? She got waitlisted. <laughs> Whoa! And then she was like, OK, I've got to get rejected. So I'm going to apply for a job that I can't get. So she, she had no college education, no experience in marketing, applied for a marketing job that required a college education and five years experience, and paid $90,000. So she applied for the job, and guess what? She got, she got it. That's right, my friend. So the poor thing, she's trying to get rejected. She's trying so hard to get rejected, and she just can't. Guy's walking down the road, she's eating a sandwich, and she, he's, she's, he's good looking, and women aren't supposed to, you know, invite men to dinner, but she said, what, I'm gonna get rejected, you know? And I, this would be weird. Maybe they think I'm crazy, they'll reject me. And she said, invites him to have a sandwich with him, and guess what, this good looking guy sits down, has a sandwich with her. I don't know if they're dating, it was only a minute long video, that was the max, but <laughs> what I thought to myself was, this, this gal's on to something, isn't she? She's on to something here. That uh, very often we, we were so fear of, so afraid of being rejected, we probably just need to get a little rejected so that we can just get over it. We suffer more in mind than we do in reality, Marcus Aurelius said. How much pain we suffer being afraid of the surgery. So much more painful than the surgery. Being afraid of the conflict. Being afraid of the move. Being afraid of quitting. Being afraid of starting being afraid of making the change or putting up the boundary or whatever it is. We suffer here, but then when we do it, we feel great. Interesting. So, go for rejection. Go for no. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? What if somebody told you that to get your dream, you just needed a no 28 times, and your 29th would be a yes? Here's what I think you would do. You would just try and hammer out those 28 no's as fast as possible. Nope, okay, thank you. Nope, okay, thank you. Nope, okay, thank you. I'm three down, 25 to go. There's a lot of math in this sermon. Okay, here, so tiny goals are important. Here's the last thing. So the first thing, have a big goal. The second thing, have a tiny goal. The third thing, and this is so important for the tenacity of getting where you're supposed to go, is important that we reframe our setbacks. Hannah told me a story about a guy in a church that was, loved this song back in the day about, he supplies my needs. And the man would dance and he would sing. He would request the song. He would sing it loud, hands in the air, jumping up and down. He supplies my needs. He's going to supply my needs. I have all I need. And then on the way home from church, his wife said, oh, can we stop by the store? We need to get Johnny a new pair of shoes. And he freaked out and said, we're out of money. We can't afford shoes. You think we're made of money? So here's two frames. The first, he supplies my needs. The second is actually, no, we're broke. So here's where the positive frame works, not when things are going well, not when the song is playing. The best time to say he supplies my needs is when you don't have any money. The best time to say that I've been healed is when you're feeling sick. You see, to reframe with faith whatever it is you're going through. See things through the lens of faith. Just assuming that, God, that it's happening for you and not to you. What a life-changing idea that is. Somebody loses their job. One person says, it's a catastrophe. I'm broke. I'm not going to pay my bills. I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lose everything. Another person says, oh, must be time for an upgrade. Time to apply for a bigger job. Time to reach out to my company's competitor. Time to do something new. Somebody goes through a breakup. They were dating for four years. They thought they were going to get married. And the first person says, oh, no, I must be unlovable. I must be undateable. I'm never going to meet anybody. I'm never going to get married. Second person says, I'm free. <laughs> Done wasting time on that loser. Right? That's a good attitude. See, we can reframe what the world frames as negative. We can reframe it as positive, and that leads us to a win. It gives us tenacity. One of my favorite reframers, Ronald Reagan, had the best mic drop reframe ever. He said this when he was being criticized about his old age. He said, I want you to know that also I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. <laughs> That's a good line. 
I've thought a lot about this, how it seems that the more I experience people old and young, that old and young are not the amount of years that they have, uh, you know, lived. It feels like there's some old people that seem so young and some young people that seem so old. <laughs> and I don't know how to put my finger on it, but this is the best I've come up with. It seems like to me, if a person dwells on the past, he's old. If he thinks about the future, he's young. Think about that for a moment. If all you can talk about is how it used to be and how this and that, you're getting old. But if you talk about all that's possible, all that can be, all that's doable, all that's makeable, all that's buildable, all that you can achieve, you're young. I believe this. Look, I love the past. I love tradition, you know that. I love history. I love learning from it. But I love the future. I love what's possible for you and for me. It gets me excited. Let's get excited about what's possible for us. If you're sick today, if you've experienced a tragedy, don't forget to stand on God's word. And don't forget this. We do not achieve our double mantle purpose in our own strength. God's right there to help us. We do not achieve double mantle purpose in our own strength. Final thought. We talk a lot about faith around here. We miss this important thing that Jesus teaches us about faith. Mark 11, if you have your Bible, chapter 22. Jesus gives us the key for miracle-working power, miracle-working life. He says, have faith in God. Jesus answered, truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, very famous, right? Anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart but believes that God does what they say it will happen and it will be done for them. Wow. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And that's where everybody finishes. But there's a, that's not where it finishes. He's not done talking yet. He adds one more thing. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, what? Forgive them. So that your Father in heaven may forgive you of your sins. Seems to me that the only thing in the Bible, other than the doubt in the heart of the people of Nazareth, that seems to stop answered prayers, that seems to stop the miracle, that seems to stop the power, that seems to stop the open door, that seems to stop the new life is this one thing, unforgiveness, grudges, bitterness, anger, hatred, dislike. That will stop God's miracle in your life. Believe, yes, but also forgive. It's a miracle sandwich. Believe and forgive. Just let it go. Every person in here has been, you know, sued or betrayed or abandoned or hurt by family members or cursed at by toxic relatives or stolen from or embarrassed. There's been so many things that have happened to so many of us. All of us have been through it, some of us more than others. My friend, you can forgive. Let's not hold any grudges against anybody because we want the miracle power of God to work through our lives. Amen? Amen. Galatians chapter 5 says, For in Jesus Christ... Circumcision availeth anything, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Faith with which worketh by love. Faith which worketh by love. Can I say it one more time? Is it weird? Faith which worketh, faith which worketh, faith which worketh by love. 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 That's what releases God's power. Forgiveness, love. That's the, that's, that's the key. We got to forgive. We can let it go. Amen. Today's a good day to let it go. You're in God's house. You can let it go here. This great place. You can leave it right there at the foot of the cross and walk out of this building and leave it behind you. Last thing. There's no reason to not live life at peace with God. Won't you become a Christian today? Many of us here, we have fond thoughts of God. Many of us have our doubts about this and that. But the Lord says, if you just have the faith of a mustard seed, like if 1% of you believes, he can use that. Won't you give that to God today? Jesus Christ laid his life on the cross for you and for me, that we could be forgiven and live at peace with God. And he was raised from the dead so that we could have eternal life and Holy Spirit power, and big vision for our lives. Won't you become a believer today? You can do that by inviting Christ into your heart right now. And if you do that, just text me the word HOPE on the number in the screen, and our team will pray for you today. 
Lord God, we pray in Jesus' name for an outpouring of your spirit. We ask for a double portion. We ask that you would increase in our heart, spiritual eyes, spiritual power to see and to do all that you've called us to do. We want to touch twice as many people. We want to make twice as big of an impact. We want to experience twice as much from life. We want to live twice as long as we thought we would. We want to have twice as much of your health, your life, your spirit, your power, your purpose, and we ask for it in Jesus' name. You said you have not because you ask. Lord, we ask. Hear us now. We're asking for your call in our life. We're willing, willing to respond to you. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And it's in the strong name of Jesus, everyone said, amen. you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The preceding program was made possible in part by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you, and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.